Welcome, and to this lecture on the 18th century trends, events, and ideas of the 1700s. And in this lecture, we're going to take a look at what's going on in the United States or in the early co in the colonies in the 1700s, and how might that be impacting the literature, the things we're writing about, things we're seeing discussed among the different people of the of the 1700s. So the first thing we have to understand about the 1700s is that we are dealing in this time called the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason. And this is a direct result, of course, of printing culture and several other things that happened over the 15 and 1600s in which a collection of different people, uh, some of them you may have heard of, some of them you may not, people like Voltaire, uh, even as far back as Isaac Newton, are really coming together, not necessarily literally, but figuratively coming together and trying to put all of the world's knowledge together and trying to use that knowledge as a way, as, as a leverage to find the answers to everything. There's a strong belief in getting to the core understanding of the world, uh, the core understanding of the universe during these times. And it's a very fascinating time. You see you know, a lot of different things happen. This is the time in which we see the first birth of an encyclopedia. And you have to think about what an encyclopedia is. It is an attempt to take all of the world's knowledge and put it into one book with proper cross-references and all of that. And that was this time. It was a time in which, you know, humans believed they could take everything, put it all together in one book, and bam, you have all of the world's knowledge. We still believe that. We still try for that, right? That's what we have the internet for. But that, that where that comes from is really during the Enlightenment. And it was really a strive to, to know more, to know as much as you can, right? That idea of enlightenment, to be, you know, to have one's horizons broadened. And that's what we're dealing with in the, eight, in the 1700s. And so centered around that is this idea of progress, is this idea of we will keep finding newer and better ways. And in fact, the Enlightenment and this idea of progress is a core piece of American identity. We're always thinking about progress, and we, we mark progress in a, as a very key piece of our identity. We're always looking to improve, always looking for better. And that comes in part from the Enlightenment, and that also comes from our Puritan background, and this idea of always being productive. So both Enlightenment and uh, in the Puritans give us this idea of progress. And of course, in the 1700s, as a result of this enlightenment, as a result of questioning all of the assumptions of society and culture, we also start to see politics and a, a challenge to the traditional politics, right? The American Revolution is very much an, a revolution of the enlightenment in that they, for the first time in a long while, they, the people are rising up and saying, wait a minute, uh, no, we are not just ruled by a king, right? If we are going to be ruled, we want representation, right? If you are going to take something from us, we need to get something back. If we're paying taxes, we want the right to be represented. And so we see the rise of political challenges. And that will be, that, you know, that is definitely an Enlightenment idea, and that will continue to spin out within the American tradition of groups continually challenging the status quo of politics. We see it in the leadership of, you know, calling for an end to, to Britain's rule over the colonies, but we also see it in citizenry. And even by the end of the 1700s, we do get people asking the question of who is the citizenry? Who gets to be a citizen? Is, you know, what is a citizen? Is it just the men? Because if you're saying it's just the men, then that's less than 50% of the population will actually be in charge of whatever it is that the United States decides to be, and that was a, d a democratic republic. So we start to see questions around this, We get to, and, and that leads us into what are rights? What are inalienable rights? That is, because you exist, what rights do you have for existence? What should not be a debate? You know, what, what rights should humans have that should not be up for debate? And of course, those rights were first assigned to men, and in particular, white men. And so this idea of challenging politics will continue to go down the line as other minorities pick up the mantle, be it women, be it Afri African Americans, be it uh, gays and lesbians, be it 
other minority groups. They're, they're all going to raise this question because we see slowly that idea of, well, we have these things called inalienable rights, but they're really only for white men. And then we slowly start to open up that, that cat, we slowly start to open that up to others. But it's only through this challenging, and it's, it's found directly in the enlightenment of challenging exactly what, what the status quo is. The Enlightenment also gives rise to industrialization and science. So science, in many ways, was held back or was limited under the, the direct rule of Christianity in Europe. But as we get into the 15 and 1600s, and Christianity doesn't hold the power that it did, and we see more and more secularization go on in less power by the church, we see the rise of industrialization and science. We see science coming up with newer answers, better answers or more efficient answers than that that's the way God says it is. And so we see increasingly more and more new ways of doing things, new tools, new technology. And industrialization is also, you know, we get the rise of, we start to see the rise of machines and we start to see the rise of people working machines. Uh, and that gives rise to larger concentrations of populations in cities. And within all of this, as I said, we see a shift towards secularism or deism. In deism, very simply, secularism means a move away from religion, a society in which its focus or its driving root is not a religion. Uh, deism is when you have people that believe in some higher being, but don't believe in it, don't believe that higher being is driving everything in the world. You can kind of think of you know somebody that's a deist. And many of the founding fathers of the country were deists. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. And their belief was, yes, there is an almighty being. I have no doubt of that. But I don't believe he's sitting, you know, and it was a he. They all believed, you know, if it was, there was a God, it was a, it was a male God. But they did not believe that the God was sitting there watching over their everyday lives and, and weighing their sins and their, their good deeds, but was a more removed, was a more abstract God. So what other trends do we see in the 1700s? Well, as a culture, America is becoming increasingly independent and distinct. That is, they are no longer the, they, they used to be kind of Europe, just in the Americas. But now they're starting to really develop their own culture, their own ways, their own dialect. Because of course, you cannot, you cannot maintain a cultural identity when you're 3,000 miles away. Because that's what Britain is. Britain is 3,000 miles away. A round trip to Britain and back is going to be at least two to three months. You can't maintain a, a cohesive identity over you know a hot 200 years that way. And so you see uh, the Americas start, or you see America start to develop its own identity. You also see a population boom, right? In 1700, there was 250,000 people in the Americas, in the colonies that were here. But by 1800, five million, right? So that population, grew by 20, by, you know, multiplied by 20, this population grew. This means we see a lot more people, a lot, a lot, you know, now we start to have intergenerational people. We have people who can say, you know, my great, 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 great grandparents were here, where other people are saying, well, I just got here. And so we see a lot of diversity in that. We see a lot of differences going on and a lot more rich, in, you know, smaller culture developing that's different from what's going on in Britain. We also again see increased literacy. You know, this is a byproduct of not just the industrialization uh, and not just the the Enlightenment, but again that printing press and that the, the continual refinement of the printing press, the improvement of you know the paper that's being used. More and more things are being printed. More and more places are opening printing presses. Right in the Americas, you start to see, particularly in the American colonies. You see the rise of printing presses, and there's there's a strong correlation of the rise in printing presses and also what goes on in the American Revolution, because the American Revolution is in part driven by written literature, whether it's the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Paine's Common Sense, uh, the, the writings of Ben Franklin, all of these things are being written and published, and you know, there's a large reading audience to receive it. 
And within that, we start to see Americans developing an American voice. That is, that we start to see just very, very small, very small indicators of something uniquely American about the writing. Ben Franklin is probably the best example, but I would even say somebody like, uh, let's say somebody like um, uh, Sinners in the Hand, it, it, Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God would be another great example. Uh, we start to see things that are that really feel much more American than they do British. All right, that's all for this mini lecture. Hopefully you get a sense of some of the driving forces of the 1700s, and we're on to the next one.